My name is Jeff. I am the president of the San Diego Marine Aquarium Society. We are the organization that's hosting this event. So I want to thank you guys and we really appreciate you coming out. With that said, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Justin Credible. Hello, everybody. So uh, they wanted me to talk about grafting infusion, and I'm going to talk about 12 things, uh, but I will mostly talk about grafting infusion. But there's my sweet little family. I like to build robots and play in rock and roll. Um, my uh, day job is uh, Fish Life Aquariums, working with this stellarly handsome gentleman here. Um, and uh, it's definitely one of my prides and joys. Uh, great little cute shop. We have Coral Farm. We do uh, a bunch of wacky stuff uh, outside just... Uh, um, the store. This is my first display tank in well over a decade because I've mostly been coral farming, so everything is just like flat racks and all that kind of stuff. So I, I kind of feel like I'm a hobbyist again, so it's kind of fun. Uh, so I feel like I'm winning. Um, one of the things that we're uh, working on with Fish Life, uh, just a quick aside, is our St. Martin uh, Coral Reef Genetic Project uh, and uh, restoration program. Um, so St. Martin, this little tiny island in that part of the Caribbean. Uh, we're uh, primarily located in Grand Cas, uh, and uh, we're gonna be uh, developing uh, a, a reef uh, ecotourism program. We have genetic mapping uh, of all the corals, and it's all gonna be uploaded to a uh, cloud database, as well as the um, uh, gene sets and all the locations of individual corals. Um, and uh, we're gonna be working on uh, all the species, and especially we're gonna focus in that area, we're gonna do a lot of work with the LPS, uh, just cause it's m most, uh, the diversity is in the LPS in that area. Um, and uh, got a whole bunch of heavy hitters and a whole bunch of other people uh, helping me out that are way smarter than I am, uh, but doing really cool stuff. So, um, really excited about that. This is, uh, we're gonna be using something similar to this on the um, property. It's this really cool uh, a walkway. We're getting uh, some acreage donated to our project. Um, and it's uh, actually rather uh, cool stuff going on, on the terrestrial side, some cool plants and whatnot. Uh, these sexy gentlemen and I uh, uh, partnered up, or we're partnering up with uh, Fruit de Mer, so they're a nonprofit down there in, in St. Martin. So it's a buddy of mine that I've known for a few years. Um, and uh, this is a book that, uh, that they published, and we're gonna be doing a Marine Life of St. Martin book with them. Um, and this, some of the, the cool things. This is just some of the garbage we got out of the, out of the ocean. Um, this is more of the walkway, this is the property. Um, so we're gonna be doing a uh, education center and um, land-based aquaculture for the reef restoration, as well as uh, lab, laboratory space uh, and educational classrooms and stuff. Um, so it's really pretty. Uh, these are actually some medicinal plants. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a tobacco relative and apparently you uh, chew it, barf, and then trip for a day and feel better about yourself afterwards. Um, this is our project, Cold Spring Harbor High School. Uh, it's an education program using, you know, we're doing coral aquaculture and all the uh, coral science stuff. It's integrated with what we're doing in St. Martin. Um, so it's uh, the tank kind of newly, freshly set up, and they're getting a lot of donations from ESV, to Little Fishies, Red Sea. Um, so uh, a lot of guys are helping us out with this. They're very much appreciated. Um, this is a really cool uh, marine science uh, aqu aquaculture school and aquaculture lab in Connecticut. Um, so it uh, just goes to show the um, what what's coming online for all these kids and. Boy, we wish we had that when we were younger. This is a new $20 million school that's right next to the property that we're gonna be developing. Um, and it is kind of a godsend because uh, now the classes are right there and they've done a lot of infrastructure. So there's a lot of pretty stuff there. Um, and basically what we're gonna be doing is some of the same techniques we do on aquaculture side for growing corals for profit. And we're gonna use those same techniques. Um, and then all the great stuff, all genes and coral cancer. Um, but uh, so the main part of why I'm here today, we'll talk about grafting and fusion for, for the most part. Um, so we've been utilizing this in horticulture for a very, very long time, hundreds of years. Uh, pretty, if you eat in a banana, those are all grafted because they're all uh, you know, clones. Um, uh, oranges, uh, every single rose you buy is grafted. Um, it's a uh, cultivator for the top half, the bottom half is wild roots. You, you can do cool stuff with grafting, saving trees and whatnot. 
Uh, this is a cool picture, just shows uh, some, some neat stuff to, you know, with the, the nutrients can't get up the stem, so they're, they build, it's called, uh, called a bridge graft. Um, so we do grafting in people too, so that's uh, uh, tissue and organ transplantation. So uh, that's a type of grafting. Um, now we're doing it with hands, um, kind, of, kind of weird looking, uh, but sometimes it's not successful. So it's uh, in order for humans to get uh, you know, organ donation or, or even, uh, even like you know, you know, with bloods, you have to match up the blood type and all that. Um, you know, we do, they, they give the test, they see how closely related, uh, if you can accept an organ from somebody, and then you still have to take immunosuppressant drugs. Um, and not all the time is successful. Because um, we have a very certain immune system, the way it works. Uh, and I'll get into that with the corals and, and why we're able to do a few things with corals a little bit easier. Um, so there's three basic types of fusions. Isogenic is just fusing to yourself. Um, allogenic is same species, different individuals. And then you got xenogenic fusion, which is different species. And that can happen from time to time. It's generally a little bit uh, under cer uh, special circumstances that that, that will happen. Uh, but we're actually doing that. There's three groups now just got funding to put to grow human organs and, and animals. But uh, we got self-driving cars to thank for that because there's going to be a whole lot less dead kids on the road. So they're going to have to farm these organs. Um, so I first got interested in fusion. And um, you know, it's been a, there, there's been work uh, over the years on, in other groups of Nadarians, uh, like hydrozoans and um, you know, a, a hydra and stuff like that. Uh, Hadaka did a lot of work with Possilpora um, and Stylophora species. Um, and uh, so uh, the, basically there's, there's, when you're grafting, it's like you're, you, you're gonna have success or not success and there's kind of different levels. Um, so ideally if you wanna try to have a fused you know, thing, that's your goal, you can eventually get like 100% like fusion and integration of the organism. So there we have the human double monster. Um, transitory fusions. Um, so transitory fusion is actually pretty common. Um, and a lot, you know, what, what Hadaka showed with the possible poor Damacornis is that for the first 18 months generally, um, you get five, six, seven, eight uh, planula will settle together, all fused together. And then once they reach mature sexual size, they actually start to separate out into individual colonies. Um, other coral will stay fused and integrated forever. Um, and sometimes they'll just they'll, you'll get transitory fusion where it's just like a couple days and then they separate out. Um, and uh, that's actually an autoimmune reaction on behalf of each coral making that happen. And then cytotoxic necrotic uh, reactions. So it's basically um, that we, we see in our tanks when corals fight, you know, and they beat each other up. So generally you're not going to get that too, too much when you match up your species. Um, but you still can get some degree of that even if the species are matched up. There are more dominant and less dominant varieties of each species uh, a coral and you will see uh, uh, and I'll show an example I believe it's uh, like blue and purple Ganyapora still haven't gotten fused together but and there's always um, the, the, the purple is always dominant over the blue there's a lot of different studies with different variants of, of coral uh, in the same species and, and showing that um, like one tends to steal nutrients and stuff from the other so that's pretty common um, uh, you'll get a formation of skeletal boundaries so this is like going from transitory fusion on down uh, before like, you know, totally killing stuff. This is almost like a, a, the, the process. So you get, say if it's a transitory fusion, actually what happens is that um, the coral's gonna say, hey, this is not me over here all of a sudden. It's gonna be like, this isn't good. So then it'll kill itself, it kills its own cells and, and set up a boundary. Um, and that'll be the, the skeletal boundary. So I'll show you a few pictures and you can see those skeletal boundaries forming in some non-successful uh, soft tissue uh, fusions. Um, and then overgrowth is just the basic. Uh, you may see this a lot. Say you have, uh, you, you graft them together. They don't 100% fuse, um, but they don't kill each other. You tend, you know, you still, a lot of times you'll end up having a dominant um, variety. And then with green star polyps, they, they have, uh, they don't, Get, uh, meet back up with themselves and fuse back together like you might see with Acropora, Monoporus. They just overgrow whatever and overgrow themselves. They're just, you know, idiots in that regard. Um, and then, you know, death and stinging is like the, you know, extreme reaction. You really only tend to get that when it's a completely different species. Um, there are some cool studies. This is showing um, uh, 
different, you know, so if you got two colonies that will fuse and then can you fuse them later? This is all off uh, Hadaka's work. Um, and so this is using planulae, newly settled planulae. So you can see really small um, pieces of the coral. But if you notice um, along the edge, there's, there's none of that skeletal boundary. There is just a very nice, clean, um, the, the, uh, everything, the soft tissue is fused. Um, and uh, let's see if I got the picture here. So basically, um, what we're looking at there and what is going to be your, your indicator of a successfully fused coral uh, is that you, you, there's no skeletal boundary and you're going to be able to see just an absolute smooth transition of like all the soft tissue. Basically, corals are just two cell layers uh, and, in, uh, and then the inside they have this mesoglia, which is like coral blood, but it's just like, you know, clear liquid, but it's how they transport all the nutrients. Um, so when you have successfully fused coral, uh, they share the mesoglia and, and that, you know, you have tr nutrients transporting between the two colonies, you get stem cells transporting between the two colonies. So um, that's what you really want to look for. And I, I got some microscope slides. So uh, let's take, let's, you know, go back to, all, you know, some other basic fundamentals of fusion and grafting and chimerism. Uh, so this is a lab created chimera of a goat and a sheep. It's not a hybrid. It, they took an embryo of one and another and kind of like smushed them together and they grew it out. And if you notice that there's different parts are the different animals. You know, got like a sheep body, goat legs, that kind of stuff. Um, this is uh, uh, a mouse growing a human ear. Uh, we're, we're utilizing these guys to do crazy stuff. This is an artist. He's growing an ear on his arm and he implanted a microphone. Um, this isn't quite, quite fusion, but it's the idea that um, it, it's going to show, it goes, goes to show the cool stuff that we can do with science, but um, you know, pulling the genes of coral out and using them for um, various purposes and, and tagging and whatnot. Um, but um, medically, and it's kind of crazy and, and bizarre, but um, you can just, it's kind of horrible. The ice picked these gerbils ears and made them deaf, and then they just put human stem cells in there, and then uh, their immune system didn't reject them, and then actually the, the gerbils were eventually able to hear again. So uh, I want everyone to just you know, think about themselves and then realize that you're a whole bunch of people uh, all smushed together. Um, so there is this, uh, I forget what they called it, but there is a condition, a skin condition, where you're like, oh, you have these either patches or striations of different, different pigments. Uh, what this is actually is two uh, embryos fused in the womb, um, and each of those different striations is different donor uh, you know, embryo. So, it's just, so this would be when you have uh, uh, non-identical twins, and then under certain um, circumstances, they can basically smoosh together. Um, and they do this at a point in their immune system where you don't get that self-non-self recognition. The immune system is developing, so it all develops together, and then it's all one person. Um, there's an instance where a woman was taking a genetic test. I believe it was for some uh, tissue donation, and it turned out she wasn't, like her son wasn't her son. It was, it was like the test said it was the, like she was the aunt, but what, what it turned out is like she was actually a chimera and she had like different parts of her. So like her ovary was one thing, but a cheek swab was, was the other individual technically. Um, uh, I love the human double monsters, what I said before. Just, so uh, mothers carry the cells from the babies for decades or forever uh, after birth. And, and this includes like um, uh, babies not carried to term. Um, and uh, and, and then we carry the cells from our mother, maybe our grandmothers, uh, inside us through the rest of our life. Uh, so right now, floating inside you, you've you got all kinds of things that are working in your body that aren't yours, um, technically. Uh, if you have inflammation or a cut, uh, the first cells to get recruited to that site are actually uh, your, your mother cells or even like a sibling's cells, uh, if they were, you know, if you're a younger sibling. Um, and uh, there are some autoimmune diseases that, that every once in a while can cause a problem, but for the most part, it's very functioning and they're doing very important stuff. So it's all wishy-washy, wibbly-wobbly. Um, and then, yeah, times illness. So, I, you know, it's like thinking about all these things, you know, it's just like it seems, corals seem like very simple little animals, so it's easy to, you know, smush them together, but then with the, that ex example, the fact that pretty much all of us are chimeras of one degree or another, uh, probably more of us are more that, you know, smushed together embryo thing than we realize. Um, but, you know, fish do it. Uh, the angler fish is a really great example. They were pulling these up from the ocean, and they're like, oh, we're only finding females, but some of these have these dangly bits on them, and then they 
turned out those were testes, and what it was it was just like the, the male fish, you know, finds the girl, grabs onto her, doesn't let go, and eventually they become fused. Um, so there's some pretty intricate stuff happening there with uh, each of their immune systems that allows them to do that, that self, non-self recognition. Um, so there are times when the immune system of even higher animals uh, utilizes uh, you know, some tricks to, to get over a hump for a purpose. Um, so this is what really, really got me going, being like, oh, I can do this and really have at it. Um, this is uh, early 2000s, so this came into our shop and it was a half and half uh, open brain coral. And uh, Terence uh, Fugazi's got uh, another uh, you know, individual, and he was talking about just even the morphology is different uh, side to side. Um, and, and if you notice, this is just like the two basic types of uh, trachophilia, but you know, the very basics of each of them. So it's uh, very obviously that it was two larval uh, individuals that settled together and, and, and grew together. Uh, and if you notice, they're integrated, they stayed integrated, and they're not going to separate. They're, they're all just that, that one animal. This is another one that actually came in later that same year. Um, and so it's a Ganyapora minor. Uh, and so I, you know, the colony was like, oh, cool, it's half and half. And then really wanted to like, take a good look and make sure if it, see if it was fused or if it was just two colonies. Because there's combos and then there's fused you know, colonies. So this, again, this is from the wild, so it's obviously a wild example of it. Um, and generally what tends to happen, uh, you'll, most of the time the, the boundary stays at that coralite edge um, as far as like the two different types of tissue. And then so like, uh, but the yellow arrow, right? Oh, so the, that, the yellow arrow is pointing to that coralite boundary. The purple and green arrows are pointed to a couple polyps where, where there is some mixed tissue inside the polyp. Um, but you see both examples uh, of that. But generally, like you'll see it in the Ganiastrias that come from Australia and they'll be like two fused together. A lot of times you do see them um, kind of at that correlate boundary. They're still fused, and they're still soft tissue fused. Like, they don't have a skeletal actual boundary there, uh, but like usually they just kind of like hit that and um, don't, you know, you know, get their smushiness all over the place. If you look at war corals or some of those other guys that have a lot of striations, you see how like they, you know, the colors will pop up here and there. Um, basically all the corals, as they grow, um, all the stem cells are recruited from areas that are growing uh, to areas that need it. Um, so it seems like a lot of times with these type of uh, you know, fused individuals, the stem cells are just kind of more or less staying in their area, but more or less they'll pop up. And I, I have an example from the show that I took a picture. I'm going to show you. Oh, this is that diagram I was looking for. But anyways, that Cohen is arc, that's what we're looking for as far as like having it be fused in that soft tissue. So you basically have the goop going back and forth between the corals. Um, and that, that's what we're looking for when we want to say something's fused. Because um, that's a semantics thing. You can graft and then great and it won't be fused. Um, and I guess grafting was a difference between grafting and comboing is probably just intention. Um, you know, just wanting to get them to fuse. Um, so I didn't actually do the cat, but this is my first, uh, one of my first runs of, of grafting and it was successful. Um, it actually took a year to, to really uh, get um, started, start fuse. Um, but if you would notice uh, on the first picture, it was basically just a standard orange crush A can, um, and then this really cool blue, blue green guy. But if you notice, there's a couple things that ha happen uh, with grafting and fusion, um, and it, it seems to keep playing out uh, all the time when we do it. Um, but if you notice the color differences, um, you know, so now the color is kind of like sh shifted over time. Uh, we are getting these green and uh, non-orange bands in the, in the orange crush. The area of fusion is, uh, is at that bottom right hand portion where you got the one mouth and it's kind of oozing over into the other one. They're actually sharing a bizarre oral disc. They have a really large mouth there. Um, but then the other parts, they're not fused yet. Um, so it's, uh, they are, if, if I were to poke at the top part or the, on the left side, you would see a skeletal boundary. Um, but what happens over time, let's the zoom up of it, um, what happens over time uh, with this and other graphs is that um, that area of fusion will start to spread. But what's in, or so this is, it's grown out more, and it, but it, it still hasn't really fused um, up, you know, all around. If you notice that actually the two orange crushes have met now on the other side, and they, they're still not fusing to each other now. Like they're, they're they, had, you know, they stared each other down for a good year before they fused. But what happened, um, more and more and more, we got the zipping up here. You can actually see this, the skeletal boundary of the kind of line there um, pretty clearly. 
Um, if you notice more, also the colors shifting more. We do have a new polyp in the bottom that's integrated with the both tissues. Now the orange crushers have fused. Uh, we're getting some more fusion happening in the other parts of the colony. Um, and then this is at like two years after, and we have complete and total fusion all around the whole colony. If you notice, there's no orange left at this point, complete color change. Um, but it did take time, and it pretty much all started from that one area, and then uh, it basically zipped up like a, like a, like a coat. Um, so uh, what we wanted to do is just make sure we weren't just, uh, you know, had a couple really uh, promiscuous, you know, acans that would get together with whoever or whenever. So we just replicated it. You know, we used some of the original uh, colonies and, and others. Um, so it just, uh, what we found is there's, there's a couple um, things that will help you have a successful graft. So number one is uh, using the same species. So you know, definitely uh, identifying the same species. A lot of people are doing monoporas. Um, generally, monopora can kill each other, but it's, it can be pretty tough to actually really uh, match up uh, you know, Capricornus type of Montipora because there's a good t dozens of species. And, um, you know, and the, but the worst thing that happens is they just kind of overgrow each other. Um, so the first thing is getting that same species. The second thing uh, that we, we notice and does seem to help is that mouths tend to get um, mouth tissue, uh, and especially if you have um, basically cut two mouths and, and put them together, they tend to high, have a high rate of successful fusion. And then um, the other area is uh, uh, some of the tissue at the, the, the edge of the polyp. Um, but what happens time and time again is that we get this color transfer, the shift um, from often one to the other, um, usually just makes them uglier, unfortunately. Uh, but it's, uh, we're not entirely sure right now what that is exactly, um, but it does happen before the corals fuse, uh, and it can, it can happen um, just by the corals touching each other. Uh, it's either, um, uh, it, some of it could be related to some of the symbionts, uh, other than zooxanthellae in the tissue, feedback loops with the uh, coral cells and the pigments they're creating, um, and, uh, uh, so, and what we notice is that, especially with the ses successful uh, fusions, is you do see a good, good amount of color transfer. Um, this is another thing that we tend to see when we're um, gonna have a successful uh, fused uh, graft. So there's actually um, a little bit of mouth tissue there. And if you notice that other mouth is like leaning over and kissing, sucking on the other coral. Um, so they have all the coral have cilia on their, on, on their you know, outer layer of their, their, their body, essentially. And it's always moving the, the coral slime into the mouth and they're constantly eating. Um, but uh, so what, what tends to happen here is that like the mouth will actually just get like kind of go over there and it's, and it's not eating it, it's not necrotic reaction. It's not like doing that thing, barfing at night and eating your other coral. It's just like kissing it. Um, so usually when you see that, you, you do get a fusion. So this is a, 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 that same coral about a month later. Um, and you can see the, the, the fused area um, started at, at the kiss. And uh, this one, you know, eventually wrapped up. Um, this is a close up looking at it under the microscope. We're looking for, you know, skeletal boundary, any kind of like borders. And there, there's not, it's just a very nice clean transition from well, one tissue set to the other. Uh, and you can even see some of the orange, um, you know, in different colors that are definitely from the different coral. And it's very neat how they do these swirls, but it's basically just the recruitment of the stem cells uh, through the mesoglea. This is that other part of tissue that tends to fuse up rather quickly or well. Um, uh, and it's, uh, a, it, I don't know the designation of it, but it's usually, it's, the, it's that tissue right at the edge of the, of the colony. And they tend to, uh, with the mouths, they tend to be readily uh, adaptable for, you know, showing the love. Um, this is a neat one. This is, again, it's like you see some color transfer. Um, this, the coral on the right was actually tanking pretty bad. It wasn't doing too well, but as soon as they fused, it got, it killed right up like it just, it bounced right back once they were like actually connected and it was just, obviously it was uh, getting nutrients from the other coral. Uh, there's another example. This one is kind of interesting because it's such a clean boundary of that, of that, uh, uh, you know, the color there. It's not as much bleed over. Um, as we saw in some of the other ones. But again, if you notice, it's the mouth, the mouth tissue, and it's, um, you know, it's more in one than the other. Um, so there's, a, there's a other successful graphs out there now. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a good tried and true one that we've seen around for quite a bit. Um, there's different iterations of it, but 
you can see that cool thing where you know this that striations to recruitment of these different stem cells. So this is like one of those corals where you know you, you tend to get these swirly patterns because of the way the stem cells recruit. This is actually a really cool one. I had to do a double take, triple take. But this is actually fused. And if you notice that it has this other red polyp over there, it's all like fully integrated. Um, so uh, and you usually don't see this much with ACANs or micromucil or how it's this now. Um, is uh, usually to see like two together, you, you know, get like a combo rock. Uh, but every once in a while, you'll get one that is fused, and uh, that's exactly what this one is. And it's very striking because it's two very bright, you know, corals, uh, you know, donor colonies. And another interesting thing here, it's doing that thing where it's uh, just the, you know, the boundary of the corollary. It tends to it's segregating itself in a way. Um, it's choosing to make a whole polyp out of the one donor stem cell line, but it's still all integrated and mesoglea is all smushed together. So that's a really cool natural uh, example. And a lot of people see these with the zoanthids, like the eagle eye and the nuclears, and there's actually a transition, some colonies, from one to the next to the next. Um, and uh, you, you can get some half and half polyps. Um, it's, you know, it's a little bit harder to try to fuse these on purpose. And then you do get jumping colors, but it's very clearly, um, you know, it's like with the eagle eye and the nuclear green, and then they're, they're definitely different, and um, you do get the jumping green on top of that, and it's almost another topic about what's causing that, um, but it's interesting. This is three different chalices grafted together. It's actually the two on the right, are the right and the left are one type. The black streak is another, and the one in the middle is, is, is a graft, and so this is a human creation. Um, I can't remember what, what the actual things were, uh, but it's pretty rad. It's over at zooanthids.com, if it's still there. This one I took a picture of, it was at Scripps, um, but it has that skeletal boundary and actually pretty big, you know, just a good example of just, uh, it was just easy to see, so, um, and it's even formed gaps between them now. Uh, and they're both monoporas, but they're not the same species and they don't wanna fuse up. Did a bunch of different graphs of many other species playing around. Um, these, these are um, goniaporas, but here we got a good example of that skeletal boundary. So there's no, this then fuse, um, it's, a, it's a small skeletal boundary on this guy, um, but you can see that line, and that's bone in between. So the, it's, it's not like one coral kills the other coral, it's like the coral kills its own cells, and then it, it, it really quickly is, um, puts out it, uh, extra calcium there uh, to keep them separated. Uh, this is uh, goniapora. Uh, and time and time again, I, I can never get them to fuse. Um, you get that skeletal boundary, and then you always get the, react, the thing where the purple is dominant over the blue and just eventually either overtakes it or just kind of you know, makes the blue less happy over time. This is a cool spiral I did. This is fun. Um, so I'm a thostochytrid evangelist, so if you don't know what thostochytrids are, or thrastos for short, um, you should, and you'll get there. Um, everyone can say zooxanthellae, but you know, eventually everyone will be saying thrastos too. Uh, so thostochytrids are uh, one of the major symbionts on coral. Um, everyone is, oh, coral have all this bacteria and all, all that kind of stuff. Well, most of the, the single-celled organisms that are symbiotic in coral are, are 90, you know, 60 to 90 percent are thostochytrids and the rest are an amalgam of bacteria, a few other things. Um, so thostrochytrids are a very interesting group and um, they're being implicated in some color changes and jumping colors. Um, what was neat about this is that, um, I think, uh, listen, yeah. So this is that color change thing that we get. So these are two lines of, of an ACAN uh, grown separately, the, the, well, one line but grown separately in two separate systems for over a year and a half, have completely different colors and everything, um, and then brought them back into the same system and started working with them again. Uh, it was kind of interesting, the fact that once I brought them back in the same system, the co their, their, their color didn't regulate. They just, they each had their slightly different uh, vari you know, variations on their color. I'm sure over time, longer term, it would probably even out without, uh, you know, putting, laying hands on it. Uh, but what we were able to see because of that was, um, at, this is technically an isograft, so it is the same clone line donor colony. So um, I knew going into it would be a successful fusion because it would be, it'd be pretty, pretty much no problem. Uh, but what was interesting was um, the, the color jumping from one to the other and um, it didn't even need to touch, um, just being within proximity. Uh, and so again, g g g lends to the theory of the thastros, uh, some of them having the capability to have some fluorescence, produce some fluorescent proteins. Um, 
So uh, if, if they had a, ex, they call it exo, uh, uh, what are they called? Endogenous, you have endogenous and the, and the uh, thyroid chytrids, and then you have the ones that live on the mucus. So there's all the thyroid community on the mucus that can get transferred to the coral right next to it just by mucus transfer. And, and the coral cells, like I said before, are always, they got these cilia and they're always like moving stuff into the mouth. So uh, it, it's very uh, within the theory that, that's currently kicking around right now that um, uh, it's the thyroid making that color. The, obviously the color can jump over. We see the, the successful fusions happen again with this color. And you can see where it started there, uh, and the green jumped over on that, on that one polyp in the middle. And then at the top, you see some of that green that jumped over uh, to that, that outer band. Um, and, and again, right there, it hadn't fused yet, but it, it, the color moved over. So this is Steve Garrett's um, really cool Acropora. Um, so I think, that, again, I think this is a similar thing with the, um, you know, what's causing this color, as opposed to being like a straight up graft. It's probably, uh, uh, it's, it's either, uh, viral gene sets getting turned on uh, by the presence of uh, an initial, with the Pasopora, you know, we had, he had Pasopora in his tank, green Pasopora, uh, they're sending out Planulae. Um, some of the green color in the Planulae, um, that could be um, a, a thrastochytrid, and then it recruits all through the coral. Um, and then again, you can see that recruitment um, pattern where it is uh, following kind of like the, the mesoglia and kind of pops around and then he's able to take that green bit and stick it onto other things. Um, so this is really cool. So I was, I was, I was down in Belize um, uh, doing some work uh, for some coral restoration stuff. I was, uh, I'm always fascinated by the, what, what happens when corals touch are right next to each other and it's like most of my pictures are like, you know, big boulder, you know, colonies, like what, what was that, what was happening there? Um, but I thought, I thought this one was interesting because it is huge, massive, massive colonies. That was just ridiculous. Um, but I, one was all brown, one was all green, and, but this, they had that, this little swirl there. Um, so I zoomed up when I got home, um, and the interesting thing is they're actually fused at one polyp. It's like a polyp and a half. Um, so can you guys see that? Or, but, um, so look, we got that same phenomenon where you get the color transfer um, and you get the fusion. And the thing is, like, you don't, fusion doesn't always happen through the whole colony. It's, it's very interesting, too. It's just, just that one part. Um, so the, you know, the coral's immune system isn't, doesn't quite, it's a different process as our immune system. So the whole coral head isn't like, oh, now we're all friends, we're all gonna get together. Um, so it's, it's very interesting, um, that phenomenon, and you might come across that too when you, if you try to fuse something together. It, maybe the whole thing isn't gonna fuse, but one part of it will. Uh, and maybe given it a time, it all will, or maybe it just will hold, hold out like that did. So um, that's just really neat. Um, so, that's basically all the, uh, most of what I got about uh, fusion and grafting. Um, you, a lot of people tend to ask me about Ganyapora, so I'm gonna, you know, I'll, bl I'll blow through some of this. Um, but uh, Ganyapora, everyone thinks they're, you know, they like dirty water. Uh, I look at them like they're an SPS, because um, it's essentially what they are. Um, so they, you wanna keep them like SPS. They got, uh, you know, all the proper conditions. So a lot of them want a lot of light. Um, they like pretty good flow. They don't want dirty water. Um, and then are, they're kind of like an L MPS. They're in that little in-between category. And you got all those other guys that are kind of like don't quite fit the bill for everyone. Um, so there's a lot of ways that everyone does tanks and everyone could be successful in all these different ways. So depending on your system, you, there, you know, some people you might not have to feed your gun, your pork because they're producing a lot of food. Other people, if, you're, if you don't have a lot of food generated in your system, uh, refugia or whatever you're feeding to your fish or, and whatnot, you might w need to uh, do some extra supplemental feeding of the coral. And also, depending on the supplements you use, um, maybe you're gonna wanna start using more iron or potassium. So actually, I'll get into this iron potassium thing real quick, because uh, I actually don't have the slides for it, um, but there, there was a lot of talk earlier with the kind of hit or miss, you know, earlier in the decade, uh, about uh, Ganyapora, and one of the things was, uh, well, maybe iron helps, you know, and that's uh, Julian Sprung was really getting in that, in, in iron and manganese, uh, and it, it does, it, and it makes it easier to keep for them. I use it for uh, several purposes, uh, not just the Ganyapora, but other corals. It helps me get better color, I get uh, better growth on everything, um, 
and then uh, it's, it's actually like a great way for uh, supplementing your filtration process. Um, and then the other side of it is actually potassium helps out quite a bit too. Um, so I tend to use, uh, basically I call it my, two, my photosynthesis two part. So I use potassium and iron every day. Um, I, tend, you know, I like to put it in the tank earlier in the day just so I get all, all the photosynthesis primed. Ideally, you know, it's like you could dose it all day long um, and it would be, uh, it's, it's more to your advantage to, to dose that during the day when the lights are on. Um, and then uh, uh, you're able to, uh, you're actually able, with the two of them, you're, you're able to get, utilize the, get a higher potassium level uh, and get more efficacy with it than you can uh, just, just with uh, iron uh, or just with the potassium by itself. Um, and then a lot of people end up doing iron supplements for their Chato or their Calerpa, stuff like that. So um, it's definitely, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it helps all different facets of it, uh, of your system. And then on the filtration side, and I'll get into the peroxide, at the end, um, I'll explain why using dosing iron with GFO and peroxide is a triple whammy. Um, so, so Ganyapore eat just like all animals. Um, so you can feed them Ganyo power. Uh, so if your system doesn't produce food, you gotta, you gotta feed it. Some systems do. My first system where I was really successful with them. I had you know, tons and tons of those little bugs all over the place. And then uh, you know, and I fed lots of little small particle food and, and then uh, you know, I was already geared for success. Um, so identifying Ganyapora, the thing about Ganyapora is like everyone thought they were all really hard to keep, but we were just getting this one species, Stokesii, and that thing is a horror show to keep for most people because it is from this is actually one of the Ganyapora from gross, dirty, muddy water. Um, soft bottom, usually all caught at the mouth of a river. Um, but other than that, all the, most of the other species are pretty much reef dwelling species. They're much easier to keep. Um, and just identifying them is, is, is relatively easy, just on the, uh, externally looking at them. And then if you really want to be sure, you can look at, at the skeleton. Um, the old adage was that, oh, if they're, the red ones are easier. Um, but the thing is, all these red ones that we know, there's all kinds of colors in the wild too, and they're brown, most of them are brown. Uh, we're just getting the pretty ones. And there's green ones that grow great, just don't get the Stokesii. Uh, and you know, they're, it's not that you can't do them, but they're definitely more challenging. Once you go up the totem pole of difficulty in Ganyapora, you know, then, then jump in the Stokesii. Um, so uh, I'll just a quick little slideshow here, some of the, just show you some of the diversity in Ganyapora. Uh, this is just, just as, like a third of just some of the cool ones. Um, and, and they have slight, slightly different characteristics for the most part, um, but the, you, know, you, can, you can shoot from the middle, you want high, high flow, well, medium flow, you know, higher light, and uh, work backwards from there. Put them on your rock, um, unless it's a Stokesii. Um, but they do happen on the reef. So I really like Somaliens, this is a, a great one. Um, you don't see it, it's not super, super common, uh, but it's, it does come in um, and there's, I think there's one over there at the booth. You may see it with the yellow eyes. This one is that kind of sucked in, but you can see it with the yellow eyes. Uh, it's w one of the two larger polyp red Ganyapora with yellow in the middle that you'll see. Um, they actually don't tend to eat, have a strong feeding reaction, and this is a pretty one with the yellow, um, but they definitely like a lot of flow, a lot of light, you, you, you blast them. Um, they, they're very pretty. Um, Ganyapora pandoriensis is actually coming, coming in a lot more. I, I don't have a good picture of it, but it's basically the thin branching Ganyapora. Um, a lot, the Aussies are, are collecting a lot of them. And um, if you see them, grab them. They're not, again, they're not super common, but they're coming in more and they are easier. Um, and again, it's like they're, they're a reef coral, uh, and, but they're green. They're a little bit slower growing. Uh, Brigozi is a, is a really hardy, easy to keep one. Very strong feeding reaction, smaller polyps. Not the smallest, but smaller. Um, it's a step above the Stuchberry eye. This is Stuchberry eye. This is, tends to be, for most people, like their first introduction to um, successful Ganyapora. Uh, it is, well, likes high flow, high light. Um, it's basically just a super puffy uh, parietes. Some of them with really small polyps can be hard to tell from parietes, uh, but we, what you can do is count the tentacles. So they'll have 24 tentacles. Um, this is a short polyp variety. Comes in several different colors out of order, Brigozi slide. Um, it's actually a family of Brigozi, selling several different variations of them. Uh, the one on the top left is kind of more what you would see in the wild, um, but they don't collect them because they're kind of ugly. Uh, Palmentis is, 
one of my favorite. Um, it's just really pretty. You almost never see them. Uh, so th there's one, if it's still even out there, it's either palmensis or somaliensis. Uh, it looked a little bit more like palmensis, but I, I didn't spend enough time on it. Um, these are really beautiful. Um, they, they actually grow pretty fast, um, and uh, they're, they're quite rewarding. But I see one every year or two, um, and I jump up and down. This is very exciting. Uh, so the Ganyapora tenuidensis is the most common blue uh, Ganyapora. A lot of them have these cool uh, tentacle morphology, uh, and some of that's just the actual tentacle morphology. And, and if, if they're a little sad, their tentacles won't pop out as much, but it's kind of normal. Um, Interestingly, I came across a tenuidens uh, that's a reef form. So this guy is one that we're mo more common seeing. They're from lagoons, um, and you can tell by the, the shape of the colony. Uh, but, they, but they tend to like high, uh, lower flow, but high light. Um, they have a little bit more tolerance for some nutrients, but you have to feed them a lot. They have, they, they have a high food um, you know, need. Uh, and, but there's this reef form. And if you look at the tentacles and everything, it's a, it does not look at all like a tenuidens. Uh, when it came in, it was you know, obviously hacked off a reef and it, you know, it had that, that structure. Um, but then when I did an a identification with the coralites, it was a tenuidens. Um, so this is something that you might see, uh, it happens regularly with Ganyapora. So there's some species that exist in one or two or three different types of environments and it can greatly affect their morphology. Um, like you may see with Acropora and, or other things. And Ganyapora is just, you know, they, all they got is these tentacles for the most part and, and the polyps. So it's, it's amazing that um, you get that big of a difference. Um, it's the same animal. Uh, Ganyapora planulata, so this is the red Ganyapora, the ORA, um, uh, grows. And uh, you see a lot of people who have been successful with the red species is a great one. Um, tends to have like purple or blue mouths. Um, they can be bright red, they can be more uh, ruddy, they grow well, uh, they eat a lot if you feed them, um, and they're a great candidate for uh, keeping them for yourself. And there's, there's some variations in colors and whatnot. Ganyapora norfolkensis is a great one for a green coral that would replace your Stokesii type. Uh, long polyps, they're green, they grow well, they're, they're very pretty, there's a lot of different, uh, different morphology. Ganyapora polyformis, this we rarely see, but when it does come in, it is very unique uh, and very, very bright. Um, you got Jibudiensis, Ganyapora minor, you got, and, then, and then Stokesii. So Stokesii, the, the one thing, like if you're ever you know, looking at a colony or whatever, just look at, look at the underneath and just see what it's like. Stokesii have a very, very uh, particular morphology. It's basically, you can just tell somebody plopped it up out of the mud. Um, there's, there's nothing that it was cut off of or anything like that. And this is Alveopora. Um, you can generally put all the Ganyapora together, more or less. There is a hierarchy of aggression that they do have with each other. Um, if you put the two bases, like the, of, the, of the main colonies together, the, one will tend to beat the other up pretty good. You can generally have the, the tentacles uh, flowing and overlapping uh, with no problem. And they do play well with Favia and a couple other coral that you can keep them closely with. Um, so hydrogen peroxide, so let's, I get a lot of questions about this, and it's part of my daily protocol uh, for dosing in all the systems. Um, we dose uh, peroxide, iron, and potassium along with two-part, um, and then occasionally magnesium if we need to. Um, and uh, what we're doing, so just on that note with the iron and the potassium, uh, iron and the peroxide and using GFO. So basically what we're doing is the same thing as like if you had ozone. So you, had a, you have a big organic molecule, ozone's making it smaller, then it's more efficiently taken up by your skimmer or carbon or even your GFO. Um, so now the peroxide is doing what ozone's doing. It's actually, it also, while it's in there, it changes the valence state of heavy metals. Right away it makes them less toxic if they were to go into an organism. But what they do if you're dosing iron is that now with that changed uh, heavy metal state and uh, with the, that um, the changed charge, they more easily adhere to the iron. They're going to be attracted to the iron anyway. And the smaller uh, organic uh, contaminants and phosphates and stuff are, are more easily attached to the iron in solution too. So you get this iron, heavy metal, phosphate chunk. And then once that goes through your GFO, the iron uh, is very attract, attracted to other iron, so it, it, it settles out on the GFO. And then that is uh, um, what happens is it kind of 
uh, instead of carbonates or you know, bigger phosphate molecules or all these other heavy metals, that, that whole matrix settles down onto your GFO, and it makes your GFO just last a lot longer, um, and it's more, more efficient. So, so I, peroxide is a one, two, three, four, five punch. It does a lot of stuff all at once. And then after it does all that, once it gets into cells, it does business too. Uh, basically, it's bad business because it's toxic. But most animals uh, and organisms have some degree of catalase or peroxidase or other um, uh, scavenging uh, enzymes that break down peroxides and superoxides. Um, generally, the higher up you are in the complexity of what you are as an organism, you tend to have more of this stuff. Um, so uh, also, most of the, you know, I'm gonna, if you play with it, just don't go get to 30% and like put it in your eyeballs and go blind. Uh, you can use the, you know, the, the store brand 3% is a great way to start getting into the peroxide, generally safe um, to do. Uh, but what it does is that, because it's going into the cells and it just really just wreaks havoc, it rips all kinds of stuff up. So, uh, so why would you want to put in your tank to do all that? Well, these corals and all your fish, everyone has catalase and peroxidase. Um, but stuff like algae, um, uh, they have some, uh, but not as much. Um, so you're able to get it in at a certain level where, number one, you're cleaning everything up, and if you do have an algae problem or something, you're trying to get over a hump, you can bring up the concentration high enough that it would start to kill algae and not the coral, and it's just wonderful that it's just like, it, it, there's a great hierarchy of uh, all bad stuff you want to kill tends to be less able to handle peroxide. Um, so there's a few ways of doing it. You can do it directly, um, add it you know, directly to the, the with a brush or a, uh, um, uh, a thing. Oh, so this is, this is an interesting concept. So, so we actually are using, you know, we use inside our bodies um, hydrogen peroxide uh, for immune you know, response. It's basically it's what, what are some of these T cells are using to literally break up and rip apart something they come across and they don't want to happen. Uh, vitamin C is a precursor vitamin that we need to even make the peroxide. Uh, it'll also neutralize peroxide, which is interesting. Um, so, uh, and the more recent research has shown that vitamin C does help you fight colds because it helps give all your T cells more hydrogen peroxide to use. Um, uh, fluorescent proteins are interesting uh, in the fact that they change the color of, of, of uh, light, um, but they're also an antioxidant. Um, so what you're gonna notice if you start treating your coral or even your tank or doing a dip, you're gonna see a change in color. Um, if, if you do, if you just, you know, blast it and, you know, you can totally kill the whole coral, but, um, you know, I'm going to show you uh, just a, a couple of slides that's in different concentrations. There is a forum on, uh, our, our forum on Manhattan Reefs, the Just Incredible Fish Life Forum. There's a thread on peroxide, and there's a couple tables there for dipping and for dosing. Um, so that'll be, I would recommend go, going there um, to, to check it out uh, longer term for um, the way to do it. And they've been doing it in, in the freshwater side for a very long time, and the barley bale and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's basically a, a natural peroxide. And uh, again, I uh, started, started getting into it at the school, and we were doing labs um, on, on peroxidase and stuff. Um, so there, there's, again, with this hierarchy, so there are animals that, even if they're a higher animal, they are a little bit more sensitive to it. That includes snails and bollocks. Um, but it's a uh, it's a good tool because of that. You can actually use it's a great dip. Uh, it's great for uh, you know pest nudibranchs, all the like. Um, however, if you go too far, you can like the, one of the first things that is gonna, you're going to see it on would be like your snails or even like cleaner shrimp and stuff. So those dosing protocols are keeps it in that safe zone, um, and, and you would get all the good effects um, uh, below the point uh, up to the point where you'd be killing everything that you're putting too much in. Uh, I prefer for brown jelly infections. Uh, I like it better than iodide. Because uh, what it does is uh, takes all that goop and all that horrible mush that would, whatever it touches, is going to make you know, the other polyp sick. It, it bubbles it up to the top. It gets it out of the teeth. It's not just like sitting there. And it's, it's uh, just, you get a, a much cleaner uh, coral afterwards. Um, and it does the same job and really kill out, kill, kills that stuff. Um, so I use it for quarantine dips and the whole nine. And it's a great algae quarantine dip. Um, so you can do direct. Direct thing, you know, directly application. So this is good with some of the more sensitive guys, like the Acropora monopora um, or Hydnophora. If you can get it out of the tank and work on it, you know, you can do it. This definitely uh, uh, an option. Be, keep in mind the diffusion through uh, the slight water meniscus. So it's like even you know a couple millimeters, it will you know 
ooze over, so give yourself just a, a little bit of space at the edge. Um, and then you can dip it, so dippings work really well. Um, you can see you know, the, the braps is completely killed. The polyps are closed, but they're, they're, they just made them mad um, with the peroxide, but they open right back up. You can see the, the husks. Um, but you do end up with this algae, uh, the, al the, the old algae you know, skeleton, basically, the, uh, the, the cell walls. Um, so you do want something to come over, you know, something to eat it. If you have tangs or anything in the tank, they're going to come over and eat it right up. Uh, and interestingly, even if you didn't get to kill it 100%, what happens is that um, it, it, even it, it, it can stress out the uh, algae enough and even denature the anti-abivory compounds they produce. So if so, a fish that most fish aren't going to eat bryopsis, but once you, you know, hurt the bryopsis enough and denature those anti-abivory compounds, all of a sudden it starts to taste good to, to these other guys. So they're going to come over and clean over the dead stuff, but even if you don't clean it, you can get it to a point where it doesn't taste horrible. And uh, so this, this is a quick, if you, know, you can take pictures of it, but um, I, I have a much more uh, uh, you know, in, in, intensive uh, table on that forum on the Manhattan Reefs. Um, so these are low tolerance coral. And this is with a 3% and one liter of water. Um, and you can do five minutes left. You, you know, and I would always recommend starting at the lower dosage um, until you really get a hang for it. And then you can, you can go up from, from there. Um, and then uh, with the Acropora, the tolerance does vary quite a bit species to species, like by a lot. You can actually do some of the Acropora in higher concentrations, but always start in the safety zone. Um, this is medium tolerance. You notice that like, the, the less tolerant uh, you know, coral are these uh, SPS coral. And then we kind of like. Um, in, in certain groups of uh, things. Notice how I have the yellow leathers on there. Um, so yellow leathers and other like chalky type of sarcophytons, they're a little bit more sensitive than like the smushy leathery ones. Um, let's say brown leathers, zinnias, parietes are actually pretty uh, tolerant of it. Um, I really like it for um, fungids or ascolemia uh, because you can get, uh, when you have like, a, like a one big polyp and it's got like this one denuded area and then you get algae in there, the coral can't regrow over that unless, uh, because you get these other, the algaes are there and then they're even incorporated into the skeleton. So you gotta like really fry the heck out of it and then it'll be able to overgrow that area back. Um, and then these guys are you know, the, the highest tolerance groups, but it's, that's uh, you know, the, the scolemias and all that kind of stuff you can really um, you really got to give it to them, especially if they have like an exposed area. Um, anytime you have like a newer coral and you can smell that sulfur growth smell, um, you know, this helps for that too. Uh, a lot of times when they're collected and the way they're handled is that some of the, 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 the uh, population of all the other stuff inside their skeleton doesn't make the trip as well as they do. And, and the whole uh, ecosystem, so to speak, in the, in the skeleton can kind of go awry and start melting the coral from the inside out. So uh, that's the talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh.